It's a Dungeons and Dragons podcast that'll really make you think. We're spicing up the rules, mashing up the homebrews, and stirring up the debates. Add a little touch of our own, and you have Chef Bolg and the Pirate Captain's recipes for everything. With your host, the Pirate Captain. It's not because I took on an entire ship by myself and walked away unscathed just off good looks alone. Chef Bolg. I have in my rules for the original AG. Don't be a dick. And look the bard. Lock the bard. Bans all bards from his campaign. That wouldn't go over very yeah. well. And without further ado, here are your hosts. Well, there we go. We're back at it again. And I've got it right this time. I think I do. Yeah, what? No, nobody? You guys aren't leaving me right? here? I, I, I don't know anything. Come on, Bo. You know, some days I wonder why I follow you dunderheads around, all right? I thought I was leading this. I'm the pirate captain, after all. Well, as always with me, my best buddies, Chef Bog and Loke the Bard. And we actually have a special guest with us here today. Hey. Yeah, but we'll get to him here in a moment. This is Chef Bog, pirate captain's recipes for everything. As always with our special side co-host. I know he's not in the name, but he's just as important, Loke the Bard. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Chef Bog and the Pirate Captains. You can listen to us wherever you find your podcast at. Uh, email us, Chef Bog and PC. We actually had an email from a very special person. We're gonna. I want to tease him real quick too. He's gonna be coming in next month. It is a professor, some uh, big wig over at one of the local colleges here in Florida. He's gonna be cool. Yeah. So, and I, I want to thank you, Loke. That was that was all you're doing. You are the one that brought all that to us. So make sure you guys find us wherever you can. Uh, share the podcast. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Tell some anybody that'll listen where we are, how you listen to us, and how you're going to find us. But with that being said, I do want to bring in today's special guest. We've talked about him so much in the past. We have referenced him in previous episodes, and I was like, well, we got to finally have him in here. With us is a, our good friend, James S. Austin. We're not going to give him a name like we usually do with our guests because – it's important that you know his name. Well, I'm just that special, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what it is. Let's be serious. Yeah, so it's James S. Austin. You can find him at jamessaustin.com or Tacitus Publishing. That's We're going to have all this information, too, on our Facebook page, uh, Drive Through RPG. Uh, this is He is a module creator. He does it uh, all, pretty much for a living, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. And I help other people make a living doing it, too. Yeah, well. By hiring out. Yeah, you do a lot of work. It's always popping on your Facebook. We see it. Uh, you, you're the, also the host of your own podcast, The Red Wyvern Inn. Now, you guys are, you guys do it differently than us. Now, we don't play the game, but you guys actually play the game, right? Yes. Yeah, we use The Red Wyvern Inn as, like, the central point, and the characters go adventuring out from there. Oh, okay. So, it, you're, you're the basic AG style, right? Uh, Somewhat, but not completely. Uh, I do keep it low level or toned down, uh, sort of in line with the way Fifth Edition runs it. So there's not a lot of craziness. We do. It's it's more about the story than it is necessarily about the uh, and the characters than it is about just the adventure and running around and doing the typical D and D from the old school days. All right. So uh, you create. Uh, do, and they play your modules, or is it kind of like a play test area too for you guys to test out modules that uh, people have come up with? Oh, absolutely, yes, yes, and it includes. But I also love to take these uh, ideas to conventions and run these modules and do play tests at conventions too. So, are you a professional DM? Like people can actually pay to have you come over and DM them. At this point, I have not been jumping into that, but yes, that's going to be a future thing. Oh, that's cool. And, you, oh, and that'll also be a, a based in a virtual world too. Oh yeah, so it'll be physical and virtual. Oh, that's gonna be dope. Look, Loke, you have you got something to aspire to. Yeah, <laughs> you can you can stop. You know, you can start charging us mooks for all the money that we owe you. Yeah, I mean, time's valuable. You yeah. should yeah, embrace it. I, I like. I don't have an issue with professional DMs. I think a lot of them kind of get a little full of themselves. Like I've experienced both the good and bad of them. I've I've met ones that are absolutely some of the nicest guys out there, uh, but I've also met some that are you know they just believe the own stuff that they smoke. Is that something that you've ran into when you've gone to these conventions? Uh, yes, and some in some ways I think there is a healthy need to have a little bit of that narcissistic 
uh, pull to you. Because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to believe what you're trying to sell them. And in, in line, though, you got to make sure your product that you're presenting is worth what they're paying. So, yeah, it balances out that if you're going to be taking money from people, they are going to get a professional service. All right. But, like, I don't know. The one I think one of the worst times is I was at a convention. I think it was here in St. Pete, and they had like a free for all kind of like type deal. They had paid a bunch of these guys to come in, and this guy was just absolutely being rude to the players. They weren't prepared. Most of them were, uh, some of them were new players. They just wanted to come in and see the game, and the, the dude was kind of a dick. Like it didn't bother me. I was like, you can be, a, you can be, a, you can be a dick to me all you want. It doesn't work. Like no. I'm just gonna be a smart ass right back. Uh, but I. These my, my issues with professional DMs is I think it's a great trade. I think it really is. If you're a great storyteller, you, you you're pretty good at this craft because it is. It's a craft that you you perfected over these years, but that doesn't give you and not to call out or anybody. Like I said, I think I think there is a need for them, but I how no I a hundred percent agree and, and there, on, there's a lot of different styles of DMs too. Like some of the, especially some of the old school guys who were from yes. the, you know the chainmail and, days who. Yes. <laughs> their goal is to kill their players. They want to prove they're smarter than their players. Sometimes, yes, very much so. That, that's a different style GM than and, the modern right. storyteller framework referee GMs that we get nowadays. Are you saying our DMs are getting soft there, Loke? Uh, are you getting soft on us? Is that why we're surviving? I, 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 I started with basic D and D. Well, here, here, <laughs> here's the thing advanced. that I would put out there first. There is a contract. It's not necessarily written, but a ver- even verbal. But there is an unsaid contract between the DM and the players. You are presenting a, a style and a game. If they are walking up, I know when I've played with some of the old school diehards. Yeah. And I sat down. He's one of the the one of them. I'm not going to do a name call here, but he is one that when we were moving through the adventure, he would say something that was just a slight key of something being there. And if we didn't take that and it, try to expand on his uh, point of just referencing it, he'll let us just roll right by it. Like a uh, stupid example, if you say that there's a window to your right and then uh, you just keep going and you're checking out the room, but you don't really ever reference the window, and then something happens. And suddenly this window becomes super important. Like there's a big eye looking in the window. Or they don't check for bars outside the window. Or check, yes. <laughs> like it, in some ways, he doesn't make it say that it should have been, if it was a clear window and not opaque, then you should see those bars. So if you try to go jumping through a window with, that you can see bars on the other side. I feel personally attacked. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> that's on you. But if he did not give you what you would have seen as a character in that setting by uh, requiring you to ask him, which is kind of the old school way, then you're eating bars. Oh, man. But I like that. I, I think that's a great challenge. I mean, if you're a newer player, I think 5e is really good for the newer player. But I think if you could actually shift back to some of those older modules where things are a little bit more cutthroat, you get more uh, Dark souls vibe versus, you know, Legend of Zelda, where things are like hit or miss. You're either going to, like, do the role or you're going to... Sorry lunch uh you're either going to do the role or you're going to uh you're going to fail like that, that that's the thing and i i appreciate out of those but i think that some of these older older uh, dms can sometimes get away with it and you got something over there for us uh look lo- ah, that's not look this time yeah. that's bogue i got lots for you but that's that's I'm not bogue. who you're looking at hi bogue <laughs> hi bogue he's yeah, got his um, hand raised no uh yeah, I, I agree that these these older DMs, um, especially the ones who who charge and they're like, "Oh, I'm 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 the great shit" or whatever. Uh, a lot of times they're necessary, um, because they do present that older style of gameplay that gets you to uh, to think a little more um, non linearly when you're playing, taking everything into account, everything at its value. And then trying to expand on that value, whereas newer DMs are going to try and push the story, going to try and push the characters, uh, whereas the setting kind of gets thrown to the side. But I why? Mean, why can't we do both? Why can't we push the story while still having that same dread? Because think about it back, think about it a hundred years ago. Actually, even more than a hundred years ago. Let's go to the Wild West. All right. If it wasn't you, it was trying to kill you. Is that old line from a Thousand Ways to Die in the West or a Million Ways to Die in the West? If it's not you, it wants to kill you. 
Mm-hmm. And that's the way you think about some of these older worlds and even in magic. Look at uh, You look at it in Lord of the Rings or even The Witcher. Any, uh, tomorrow you could just die because something just walked onto your property and just like, eh, I don't like you, I'm going to eat you now. And I think you need that sense of dread and adventure. You should be worried about your character. I think it brings on that personal connection. Yeah, I mean, that... I- uh, that's. <laughs> I, I stumped him. But you're also yeah, not going to get that on a convention one shot, right? You, you know. But, but there, I, yeah. I will say, here's your problem, though. That's a flaw in the world building, because if you can, if you have to step out your door and worry about surviving, there wouldn't be a door to step out. You wouldn't live there. You wouldn't survive there. So why? So you have to create that balance of sure, there are dangerous areas or things dangerous can happen. But there has to still be a sense of survivability on a daily basis for the regular individual. Well, that's the way it was even in the Wild West. I mean, as you went west, it got more dangerous. You could always come back east where everything was a little bit more developed. You're thinking of, you know, the cities and stuff like that. But now you get back out to the west and it's, you know, it's a doggy dog world out there. I don't think you should ha- you're you're going to run out and you're going to be like, "Oh, well, you know, there's a griffin flying around. I guess it was a it was a life well lived." <laughs> no, I'm thinking more along the lines of that, you know, tomorrow there could be a local bandit rush, and now we have bandits in this town that we've never had before, and now the adventurers are coming in. But those adventurers should be worried that, hey, look, you know, bandits, things. And I think that's as a DM, and you, you were getting on world building. We talked about world building during lunch, uh, you know, with items and stuff like that. But that's how, okay, how do you how do you balance that world? Your you, closest thing we have to a professional DM right here is you, somebody who gets paid to do this, who builds the worlds and stuff. How do you set those standards and limits in your own world uh by adhering to kind of that like i said about with any type of when you sit down at a table there's a contract between the dm and the players they should be expecting certain inalienable rights <laughs> <laughs> they're players so they're say. not people yeah they're but they have uh expectations and if you take away and destroy those expectations of, say, being able to walk out your door without instantly dying from a griffin carrying you <laughs> off to feed their young, <laughs> the uh, the scenario ends up being, well, what does twist it up? So you have to build, you have to think beyond that. What's the backstory? What, Where does that seed of that idea of that danger come from without destroying everything else that's in that? Because you got a great one, alpha predators. You have alpha predators in certain areas. They cover, lines cover so many miles in their range, this, that. And then you have obstacles that separate it, like mountains and things. So it you end up having to think of all those little things while you're dropping down that little danger seed. Man. Yeah. I'm but, very glad that I don't DM anymore. <laughs> uh, and when you're DMing, too, though, like the danger factor, if you a DM can kill anybody at any time. He has that power. It, you know, Lightning bolt flies out of the sky. You're dead. But that's no fun for the players. Who's going to keep playing with a DM who kills their prime right. for no yeah. reason? I, I don't think it's so much as killing them for no reason, but it's it's definitely that you know that sense of dread. I I think you need that. It builds courage, and you're going to have the scare the scared characters. Like I, I mean, ima- think about all the good stuff that Usopp does for One Piece. Everybody knows One Piece, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, except for old Loki here. He knows he doesn't know who One Piece is, but Usopp is the scared, uh, the scared character that does all this stuff. But he still pulls off these amazing feats. But it's uh, it's you know he overcomes that fear, and I think that is. I'm not saying that the Griffin will take you off as soon as you walk out the door, but you need to know that there's things out there that are dangerous. And I think these old school professional DMs have actually done a great job, but I think we've kind of lost that. A yes, little bit, edge, so yes, the edginess to the danger. Yes, no, I, I'm not trying to call that the game's getting easier. The game is getting easier because we're trying to be more acceptable to new players. In fact, my my little brother just found out about the game, and I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna buy." I, I bought him the DM, the mon, uh, the DM manual, the monster book, player's handbook, and the two best books, in my personal opinion, Xanthar's Guide and Tasha's Burning Cauldron. Uh, hands down, best books out there is those two. Not Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica with their busted uh, guild abilities. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're they're catering towards the magic players, so yeah, they have their expectations. What do you got over there for me, Bull Gold, buddy? Uh, just, um, yeah, settings. 
I've done a lot of world building. I know James over there has done a lot of world building. I mean, his Chronicles of Allegis, that's how I learned 5e um, way back in the day. Uh, and he really helped inspire me and in, in what I was doing because there were certain parts of the map where he's like, yeah, no, you got to be like level five or above to go there. And if you try, you're going to die. Those were the uh, like some of the deadly missions that you had. And mm -hmm. so when I was building my world, I was like, yeah, there should be some areas where you're, <laughs> the normal person's not going to be able to go there and survive. No. Uh, like I've got the Dragon Coast, which is up a certain coast. There's a reef where the dragons go to mate. You don't live within 30 miles of that coast just because you're then just food and fodder. <laughs> it's it just the inspiration for that. And I do think that a lot of um, a lot of modern DMs that are getting into it for the first time, they they are lacking that kind of edge. A lot of it's too too uh, soft. It's soft. I wouldn't right. even call it soft. I'll, I'll just admit it. I take the, the the Fallout approach where you're scaling to the level of the characters. And you they know. get complacent. Yeah. 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 You know, it, it, your and neighborhood that had all goblins last week now has all orcs this week, then has all Ginth Yankees next week. <laughs> and, and that's part of the, again, that's part of the contract. If you start out and they know that there's a deadly element to it, they know that they should run. If they go in there fearless because you've always been soft with them and that everything's uh, uh, easily defeated, then they're going to get way too comfortable with it and then that one time that things go a little awry, that woo, it's that, gonna be ugly. It gives it that Goblin Slayer, right? Everybody's yes. seen that anime, yeah. right? Do you oh, remember yeah. the great? That's a great D and D mm -hmm. anime. Uh, and you get that first episode where everything was like, oh, they're just goblins, and they get swarmed by it. So I, I can yeah. see that. How do you now? He uh, Bog over here. He mentioned. You know, hey, you're not level five. This is probably deadly. How do you tell players that without kind of like almost metagaming? Because if you tell a player, oh, you're not level five, uh, you, you shouldn't be here. That, that That's kind of like instead of like, may, how do you describe this area as being tough without telling them uh, you need to be level five before you get here? Well, feeding off of what he said. So in the world building aspect, immediately there's going to be tales of people that know of that area right and there's gonna be plenty of tales that have never been heard because everybody who went there is dead and long gone so uh, there is going to be that sense of dread and fear when the dragon coast is brought up there should be plenty of lore plenty of rumors and just that alone and the fact that there are probably no real trails unless it's a dead city out there that's going to lead people to want to hey let's go out there and see if we can make some trade you know, oh, that'd be a great port city out there, you know, or, you know, let's go along the coast to to the other side, you know, because I'm sure there's plenty to sell. Uh, no, you're going to be eaten alive. <laughs> yeah, I had an ancient I have an ancient city that an entire army marched to to find out what was there and did not come back. Do you think as a level three adventurer, it's a good idea to go there? Probably uh, not. I mean, no balls. And, and that's where the, the whole, are you sure you want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The DM's famous. That, that's DM speak for you mm -hmm. might want to rethink this decision. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can see that being a, a thing. I Asking asking questions like that I think is great as a DM. Like We, we always want to ask the DM questions, but I think the DM, it's very important for a DM to be asking the players questions too. Uh, how do you? How does your character feel about this? Get them thinking about the player themselves. Get them to start thinking as an individual. Because yeah, we're as a group collective when we're playing the game. We're always a team. Don't split the party. That old famous mm -hmm. adage. But now you also have to think as a player itself. And we've talked about this in the past, where you know everybody wants to be a part of like one person's adventure. So if somebody's out adventuring through the city and you get that one little nugget of information. Then everybody's like, oh, I was there too, and now I got to hear it. And you're like, well, no, hold on. So I think it's very important that DMs uh, ask their players questions as well. Mm -hmm. I do want to get into some of your modules. You uh, just re I, I, I wish I had pulled it up. We, you just recently released a module. What was that all about? All right. So we have a line called uh, they're just start quick adventures. We have quick encounters, and we now have, which this one is a quick haunt. Oh, yeah, I so, wanted to hear what this was about because I've seen the, the Q Encounters and the Q Adventure. Uh, yeah, right. I wanted to know what and this one was I even about. have a Q, uh, quick hunt, a Q hunt, that uh, you go after a, a black heart, uh, a really large evil stag, fey stag. Mm. Uh, but this one's about a haunt. 
And really what it does is it twists up the encounter to have haunt effects so or haunt events, which then lead to haunt effects. So it sort of levels like exhaustion, and it feeds off of that. And then as, so example, when you, when you arrive, you get a sense of dread. People will roll. Uh, if they survive the roll, then they're fine. If they don't survive the roll, they start getting a little edgy. And then at each of those levels, and it's not as deadly, but it can be to the encounter. So uh, exhaustion starts taking you out to death. This one just drives you to the point of fear and running away. And I didn't feed off of the Call of Cthulhu style of using sanity. I just, and it's probably going to be always tailored towards the haunt. So, like, if there's a gory haunt, it, the all the haunt events are going to be based on visuals of gore that you see, where this one's a haunt of a ghost. And there's uh, what, what's been called now disembodied spirits, which in, in, uh, they uh, fuse with, items that may have killed them or are markings of their death. So like a shackle or a bar or a, a scalpel, all these different things have now become haunted and they attack. And so while they're fighting and while they've had these haunting effects take over them, things can happen that typically wouldn't happen during an encounter. So it changes everything up. And this is one of the things I wanted to get you on here for, because I personally don't use a lot of modules. I steal pieces. So I'll mm-hmm. like, like your mechanic for the haunts or for yes, the, the yes. dread. I'll go in, I'll read a module, and I say, hey, that's really cool, and I'll pull that into my homebrew game. Mm-hmm. You know, because I get I, I feed ideas out of, but I've never been one of the ones that sit and, and run a module. And I haven't played a lot of modules either. So I, I like that alternate perspective of having somebody in here who has that module perspective. And it's not even really, uh, these, the quick ones are always just drop-ins. Yeah. So it's not meant to take over a whole, it's a, a part of a session even. It's half of a session, two hours. It's like a side mission. Yes. yes. Something to happen that while you're going somewhere, like this one is an empty jail. So you may use that as an actual, let's go to the site and see about, because some a, a library wants to build at the site at this uh, abandoned jail, but you could also be just crossing uh, the plains and see this jail sitting there and think of it because one of the the hooks is it's raining outside. It sucks. So they want, you want to get cover. You go in and guess what happens? I got a, and as a question for you uh, in taking off Luke's point is, is there a benefit and you were starting to touch on it too, you know, the benefit of doing modules versus uh, long running campaigns, uh, arguing on behalf of the module for us and for the listeners out there, what do you think the the benefit of more of doing more module based encounters is versus doing like a long running campaign? Uh, sometimes a DM gets burned out. I know that sounds strange, <laughs> and prep time starts getting really tight. So a module, as long as they have time just to sit down and read a bit of it, they can and they generally have a good flow to how they run. So they just combine the two and you're just using the stats and the data within the module to help and that's the key of the module is how well it presents the data quickly to the dm and then that allows them to make it so it feels seamless even in a campaign so you can drop in something for that will just help them to level from five to six and then run from there but it doesn't have to take over the campaign itself no yep that's um when I was doing the AG, I, I would look to the modules for ideas on what on what to do because they were they were that's exactly what you could do. You just drop them in, and just run it as a as a standalone mission. Uh, but I could also see it working very well in a, in a campaign, just being because there's there's travel time and some of those those things where you're not quite prepared for what you're going to be doing next. Well, here's a module. We'll just pop it in there and, and uh, just do that real quick. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the session for the day, and then you have more time to plan out your your next um, your next uh, session from there. And the other a very important thing that a module can do is you may not be strong, say, in rolling role play encounters. So you can have in front of you a breakdown of a role play. Like I love trying to do that, where like we were talking earlier about the hexagon adventure. Well, parts of that are all role play, where you get you get to say. Uh, one of them, you try to deal with centaurs who are hunting. They're on a hunting expedition. 
So now you got to try to convince them that you're not there trying to take their game or to try to hunt them or to kill them or impede on their land. So you have this role play encounter with a chart saying, all right, these are the details of what you can do to help survive this encounter. And it's not combat. And you may not like, and players feed off of different, each player can feed off different things. Some people love role play more than lo they love combat. Some people just love shopping, let alone combat or role play. Mm -hmm. So it, it really does help you strengthen the, your weaker parts as a DM. Now, how do you how do you overcome that? And you're talking about players enjoying different parts of the story. Like it's hard to balance that. And you know we've heard Loke <laughs> explain how he does his. Uh, you know, Bolg, how he does his. I, I I don't DM enough anymore, and it's it's honestly piss poor for me to explain how I would cater anything to anybody. I, I, I was more module based. I was helping with the AG a little bit when I could. How do you help balance that time for each player to make sure that if you've got a group of four that everybody kind of gets a little bit of that one action that they like? Uh, that is tough because you could be trapped, say, in a dungeon for a long time and people that enjoy role play are going to be out of it for a while. Um, and you got to kind of look them in the eye and gauge what's going on with them and or find ways to create uh, moments where they get to shine or you get to feed them things or even, you know, uh, just and it can be simple. It, don't, it doesn't take, I hate to say this, but sometimes it doesn't take much to make somebody happy when you give them <laughs> attention. I mean, all guys know that. Yeah. Um, but it's that same type of, like you said, it's very difficult. And to find that, uh, I don't know what the true answer is, but you've just got to be able to look everybody in the eye and say, uh, it's been four sessions. Have I done anything for you lately? You know, do the Eddie Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to swing back to modules real quick, too. So, I, like, how do you... You know, Bolg was talking about, you know, hey, I, I was reading through your modules for ideas for mine or ideas from these modules. How, because you create modules from scratch. How do you find the ideas? How do you reach out and say, mm, that sounds like a good idea? I can turn this into something. How, what's your creative <laughs> process behind that? We're Some, selling trade secrets here, though. Yes. Uh, sometimes they're just ideas or just little key things. And I will say sometimes it's because you have stock art that's available and you like this creature and you want to build an encounter around it. It's as simple as that sometimes, and then you just your mind starts to wander. And as much as I don't know how often people say, like, they dead end and have that, that blank moment where they can't think of anything, I've been fortunate enough that I seem to have an endless well ray at this point that I can pull anything out my butt. <laughs> you know, uh, even when sitting at the table that I've been doing this for so long since the 80s, that uh, off the cuff is not hard to do and still make it seem like, I don't want to say like it's being ran from a module, but I've had enough times and enough reading in my background that I can fake it real well. Okay. Now, we were talking, uh, we're going to get, I got plenty of like things and topics I want to hit to you before we get done with the hour because uh, you, you've been a wealth of experience. You, you've met most of us before. Uh, Loke was the only one that you met him only through passing, but you showed us and you've taught us so much as we've been players. Uh, so there's a thousand and one questions that we want to get to. Well, my biggest, you. my biggest question to you right now. Uh oh. Plus one items, are they really magical? All right, that's a good question. But so, in fifth edition, it now is actually more relevant than any other edition. To have a plus one item in second edition, third edition, or even back in first, it it wasn't much. You were looking for that plus five Holy Avenger. But in fifth edition, you don't need it. There's so much balance in the way that they have these characters created, the way the system works, that a plus one is a, it's more significant. Now, to say, like, and that's where, to me, as a, a designer and as a crafter of the, the story, uh, I was very partial to the masterwork, like you'll see in uh, Pathfinder. Right. So ma masterwork weapons, they only give a plus one damage, but they don't do it to plus one to hit. Plus, if a creature requires a magical item to hit, it's still insufficient. So there's that. that's a stepping stone that, so if it's not magical, what does it take? And then... But there's like, and uh, as can be pushed, as you have pushed before, that 
a magical item should be something of significance. And it only being plus one, so it should almost be already a plus two to be considered magical versus plus one because of the effort and time required to make one. I I just think, it, and once you get towards the latter half of campaigns, when people are getting harder and harder to hit, like not even just pe- the players themselves, and you can find this with enemies, certain enemies you're, you're up against, and you almost have to have a nat 20 to hit uh, just on that. And I think a plus one is a great little item to like kind of hold. But it doesn't really do much. When I think of a plus one, I think somebody like a smith that's just spent a little extra time on this item, not a whole lot. He just kind of like grinding down the grindstone a little bit, makes that blade just a little bit more sharper than he would have in the last. But you kind of like, like you're saying, when you get to plus two, that's like having a wizard or somebody kind of like oversee the process. He's added his own little special magic to it. And I think... Well, again, remember that a plus one and a plus two... Uh, they are strengthened, so they don't break. Like especially when you do uh, failure rolls or things like that, and or you'll see in certain um, uh, different rule sets within Fifth Edition where it says an item would break unless it's magical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I see it as two different paths to the same thing. You have the plus one that the Smith has just made a little bit better, just done a little better quality work on, and then you have a plus one. That could be the crappiest crude sword in the world, but a wizard has put a blessing on it, yeah. or a cleric, or somebody has made it, uh, put a magical touch to it. That <laughs> it touched it magically. That, that, <laughs> make, yeah, that makes it Of course, it just the cleric's going to touch it magically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit better than that, that regular sword it has started out as. They both give you that plus one. They're, both, they're two separate roads. Now... Reading the monster manual, this monster needs to, you know, is resistant to non magical weapons. That plus one masterwork ain't going to overcome that. You're still going to have to be taking half damage on that. That, and that can hurt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, whereas that, that crappy sword that just got that little bit of blessing on it is going to be doing full damage to that creature. Now, what would that make silver weapons also kind of like magical considering cuz a lot of, there's a lot of creatures out there that only can be hurt by silver weapons. Oh, uh, I wish they jumped on that so much more. Yeah, that yeah. and the iron cuz iron's supposed to be effective against mm-hmm. most fey and ghosts like, like that. Yeah. yeah. That Yeah, I, I, I wish 5e did more with weaknesses mm-hmm. and, and flaws like that that and I, you can homebrew your own stuff but they, they Yeah. The old editions the did a lot more. The opportunity is just so there. I, yeah. I, it's silver a silver alloy weapons really good against ghosts and fey and stuff like that, but they break so easily if you try and use them against a regular person. Yeah, well, and or there, bronze. There were certain, yeah. Cre- yeah. Bronze yeah. There were certain creatures that mm-hmm. in the old editions you had to have a golden crusted weapon or something. You know, uh, I'm with gold you. Gold is soft. Soft breaks, and yeah. that might be a good reason why trying to launch Dark Sun now as a fifth edition would be tough. Yeah, because a lot of their weapons are. Much cruder. No. In the bone and yeah. kite in a shell and all kinds of different other forms because metal's so scarce. Oh, crafting. Because uh, it's something we don't spend a whole lot of time in. We're already talking about plus ones in masonry. Now, obviously, the artificers kind of come out and it's kind of revolutionized crafting a little bit because it's kind of got crafting built into one of its class, into its subclasses. You would think. I, 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 I think it needs. I think it needs to be expanded on more. But I think it's it, it's the yeah. start of an early. I think there honestly should be a class in the game that is nothing but what do you do? Well, I'm a smith. Like mm-hmm. it, because they kind of took away the professions of the game in five e yeah. versus yeah. like you know three point oh three point five where you you could and be limited skills. Yeah. That, yeah. that is one yeah. of my biggest peeves about the artificer. Actually, is. You can do a lot with your infusion. You can create your own bag of holding. That bag of holding is one takes up one of your five by the time you're level twenty. That you can do your entire career. Yeah. Well, no, no, you can switch. It, it gets switched yeah. out, but it, it'll lose the if ability you, if you yes. switch it out. Yes. Yeah. yeah but That's that what I'm ruin, saying. But that ruins that. You're thing. You're not creating it. You're just temporarily making. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I don't think that's right. And that's supposed to be only like a. My, I want to say minor, but it's only a sub ability for right. what it is. It shouldn't be, but the yeah, artificer should not be based on just because you can infuse one item. Yeah, because right. if you think about it, then that's all, that means only artificers have ever made any item out in the world. And how many artificers are out there that they made, let's say a campaign has a, a decent amount of 
magical items or items of that kind of nature that you're telling me that there was only f- this guy only created five and then what he died what if he's an elf and he can live forever or do, you know same way with doors who have these long lifespans you're telling me they, they could only figure out how to do five items i'd like to well, see that, and that's right and that's where you're going with it is that yeah there should be that supplemental crafting ability building of creating of other items and stuff i would yeah, I, I, I like I like the infusion if you're doing it in a battlefield where you're doing it on a short rest to change your infusion that I, that works that way mm-hmm. but that that artificer should be able to craft on like downtime for example to craft something that is a permanent magic weapon that doesn't count as an infusion yeah, yeah. And, well um the way i the way i was looking at it kind of is that the uh, the artificer is kind of like a sweatshop you know, it's they have a bunch of different things that they Get can do. Get in here, Uyghur Muslims. You're here for us now. A bunch of different things they can do, and they can pump them out really quickly. But that, uh, like, if you're a sweatshop for shoes, you get a bunch of different types of shoes, sneakers, trainers, uh, loafers, all that kind of stuff. But then you go to that Italian shop that makes that one type of shoe, and that shoe will last you a lifetime. That's what we're missing in 5e is that class that's able to do that. Well, that, that. But see, that's kind of the bad of it. You got to remember that these guys, these people that we're playing, are adventurers. They're not crafters. But why can't if they're you... crafters, that means they're plopped down, working somewhere. I want with t- a with a full s- setup. I want to take. I want. I want to take that. Well, why can't you? Because you have to. Sometimes you have to go out and get your own supplies. Like there, and you see it in not only in stories and anime and different things where these guys have had to go out and get their own supplies. Why can't a crafter? Also, be an adventure. You know, you give them a couple things where they're uh, you, you help them out. I think it's a great new class that we're missing out on. And their subclasses are oh, you got an alchemist, you've got a smith. They have a few battle abilities to kind of help them survive because they have to go out there and do those things. But then they also support classes. I really think we've gotten away from support classes and gotten more into combat classes. Well, okay. Well, I'll put it to you this way. This is one way I would look at it. I'm going to throw you for a loop here. Try me. Out of everybody that's sitting here, how many have actually trained in martial arts and spent a lot of time doing it? Now tell me, how long has it been since you've done it? Uh, 2016. So it's been five, five years. years. Yeah. So how do you feel about your combat skills as a martial artist right now if you had to step out that door? Um, I could take you guys on. Any, outside of that, I'm probably going to be boned. <laughs> well, I've also had a lot of martial arts. All right. Well, then I think so, it's going to be a fair fight. Yeah. So... To say that, right, so your skills immediately start to drop and droop. And I mean droop physically. (laughs) Anyways, uh, personal. Even if I had a martial arts class yesterday, I think I would still be. Right. So (laughs) the thought is, is that you, if I show you how to be an automobile mechanic for a week and then expect you to go out into the world and suddenly be uh, an automobile mechanic on the fly constantly, then you're not going to do so well. But I, and, and you're going to have to suffer through it. But that means all your other skill sets that you've been doing are start going to start to kind of fade. Well, here's how I'm going to argue with that. So yeah. as an auto mechanic, all right, what are you usually doing? You're busting knuckles. So mm-hmm. by the time your hands have built up a resiliency, so you got usually really tough hands, you can do a little bit more. You're just tougher in general right. when you're an auto oh, yeah. mechanic. Your grip and all so, that, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So now that kind of, that can kind of like relate over into. No, I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. Are you going to be a fighter when it comes to fighting? No, but mm-hmm. you're going to be decent out there that you can kind of hold your own. I think. Right, and that's where we're at with the artificer. Yeah, I. They're decent at what they can do, but they are not master craftsmen that spend a lot of time on the table in the in any of the smithies or anything like that. So really, the it's great, like you said. Uh, that, as I point to somebody, it's bold. that <laughs> Bolg. Uh, You've known him for a long time. Yeah. How do you not know my bestest buddy? So <laughs> Bolg said that, yes, they have the ability to do on the fly. And you kind of pointed it out indirectly that, yes, they have the, the skill set to do it on the fly, but it's not, it doesn't sustain for a long time. So if they... If that were the case, then why don't you just be a craftsman? Yes, you can walk away from the craft for a week and go out and gather up your materials, but that means you got to gather everybody else up, and then are you going back to your crafting? Well, like I, the the idea I want behind it, and this is just me trying to like yeah, create yeah. a subclass or create a class right here while while we're speaking, is the idea is that 
you're going to have somebody that, uh, first off, they're not going to be good when they start because you're a level one crafter, right? We've talked about this in previous episodes, you know, the difference between starting level one, level three, how you incorporate being a somebody to a nobody uh, mm-hmm. when you start a campaign. So this crafter would probably be out there learning. And he's out there. His whole thing is, and he's maybe maybe not combat related. He knows a few things to either fight in combat, be a be a, bl- a blessing for his friends. You know, hey, while they're all uh, resting from combat, what are you doing? Well, I'm I'm repairing dents in the armor. I'm patching up this and stuff. And that's part of what the artificer does. That there's a whole thing. But this would be specific to them. You know, hey, look, I'm an alchemist. So while everybody's sitting at camp, what am I doing? I'm out looking for herbs. I got my mortar. I've got my uh, my pedestal, and I'm out there creating no, and potions. That's great play. That is great play. But we've lost that because now when you look at the skills. There's uh, how many skills are there? There's like 20 of them, and if that, they're they're so broad. And I hate this, and I've, I've said this in previous episodes as well. It's like a reason I hate Arcana. What what about Arcana? Are you good at? Because there's yeah. multiple oh, schools absolutely. of Arcana that you can't just no. be good at all of it. That yeah, doesn't work. It, yeah, you don't like you got a stat of a 15 and or a plus four in there. That doesn't mean technically speaking that it should be plus four across the board. With illusion versus divination. Yeah. You may never once divine anything. You couldn't even divine that you're having a cup of coffee <laughs> the next morning. You know? That, yeah. so and That's even cross-class as well, because a, a warlock and a wizard could both have a plus four of the arcana. They're not going to have the same knowledge at all. Yeah. But yet, suddenly they seem yeah. to. Yeah. 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 I, I've been trying to argue that, and I honestly want to create a new uh, 5e sheet where the skills are gone with that one and you bring actually back in the Pathfinder skills. Because Pathfinder, I think, did it well. Because you, mm-hmm. you, if you picked Dungeoneering, what were what were you good at Dungeoneering? Were you good at mapping the dungeon? Were you good at trap finding in the dungeon? Like, what about it? Mm-hmm. And I think with this crafts, the Craftsman uh, class that I would love to create one day is that the, that's the idea. They're not there for combat. I... I, I want to bring back the support role. The support mm-hmm. role is very overlooked. It usually gets handed over to the cleric, and the cleric uh, is usually somebody that wants to be a combat person anybody. anyway. The bard, we talked about it, I think it was either the last episode or the episode before, episode 10, where the bards are no longer... They're, they're just your be, master spell cl- caster yeah. now instead of, oh, but instead they of the entertainer great. they used to be. But yeah. they could be the greatest yeah. support character there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but nobody ever and plays it that way. It right, right. Yeah. But that's on the yeah. player and the DM. The DM first has to also promote the opportunity for the player to play that class. Like you said, I would love to sit down and have you ru- play a character that whatever they are, I don't care what class they are, but maybe you're in a herbalism and you love gathering. You can spend your off time. I, I will tell you that as one of the things, like you said, I expand on that and I let my players learn other, like I have somebody that's learning how to cook. You know, those are key skills. That's that's where the chef and chef bowl came from. Yeah, is it, he needed something to do. He found uh, a certain kenku, and uh, that kenku disappeared. <laughs> May have uh, been with some barbecue sauce. You don't know. <laughs> oh, I had a character that died uh, uh, because I, I had to go away for a little while for training and whatnot. And he was actually a really fun little kenku. He was all about traps and explosions, so he just threw so out. Then he t- became a tasty kenku. He kenku. became dinner. <laughs> it just became dinner. He was dinner. all about traps and explosions because Broken or Bolg would throw him into the trap or explosion. <laughs> you ever, you ever kill somebody with caltrops? I have. <laughs> Yourself? <laughs> uh, no, actually other players. Two other players. I killed a friend of ours, and I killed uh, somebody in one of our... Was it Adventures oh, yeah, Guild or something like that? Mm-hmm. I've I've killed people with caltrops. It's the best if you kill something that does a D three of damage. Yeah. Oh man. Well, it could be worse than that. Yeah. The fifth edition caltrops not pretty. I want I, I want the if this was like PlayStation or Xbox, I want the gold level achievement. I've killed somebody <laughs> with yeah. caltrops. The badge. Yeah. But it's it, it is. I, I I think that we've gotten away uh, from those little minor things that make characters unique and crafting i think is something that we overlook there should be like that's what i want to see 5e i don't want to see new modules about you know going to college or things like that i want to see a breakdown of a new crafting system because it's not been expanded upon in any of them it just says oh it takes a few days okay well how, what does it take a little bit in the back of xanthar yeah. xanthar's tried yeah. xanthar's tried but it's it didn't now. it's not what it is no it needs a it's, full, it's very vague yeah. it's like okay if you're baking a, a magic item of this level it should cost about this much and, and need a com- component yeah. from this level of monster 
Yeah. At, at least that brought in some kind of a component factor. And but there is no book big book of blueprints that you know That's, I want to make the luck blade. Here's the ingredients for a luck blade. You need to be a level twenty mage, you need a level twenty cleric, you need but ten I, pounds of diamonds. I like whatever. that though. Yeah. There, there's the name of the mo- the book right there. Look the bards, big book of blueprints. <laughs> but I was, and, oh, and Shep, I was uh, thinking uh, Mordenkainen's guide to downtime. I mean, that would that would be good. I, I could see that. Well, there we go. Start writing. <laughs> All right, wizards, come come hire us. Yeah. I, I, it's just I. I tell you what I liked about Xanthar's though that it did add was mundane magical items that really they're just almost useless and counterproductive. I want to see more like that, like a the dancing tankard and things like that. I I think those are fun. Uh, yeah, I love those in character. Uh, I, anytime we start that you're not a level one character, you start with at least one of those because mm-hmm. the the billowing cape is just the best. <laughs> 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 All right, Batman. Oh, um, I speaking of magical items, where do you draw the li- limit on magical items? You always have to feed characters because they're always wanting. It doesn't matter, but. Uh, I am very much to the point of it's a trickle. And it always depends where you're at. It always depends what would be found there. I mean, you're not going to go and find crazy swords in just a uh, dungeon of monsters, you know, that don't even use swords. You know, maybe you'll find a body with somebody that got killed with a sword, but... Uh, well, you, and people, what if this whole land doesn't even know what a sword is? Well, here's You're the qu- not going to find a sword. Here's but my, people think that they should. Here's my argument to that, and we'll, we'll get to both y'all guys here in a second. Here's my argument to that. Think about it when they went into the Hobbit and they went into the Troll Cave and they found all the swords from the elves. Mm-hmm. Why do the trolls have swords? So I, I that's right. my argument against What's you on their, that one. No, that's well, a good and, question. And that's one of the things. The Why old, would they care? Old edition monster manual, in each monster type, they would have a treasure type. Yes. They would oh, list man. treasure yeah. type A and G, that. and you would go to the table. Of, uh, treasure type A would be all trinkets. You'd roll on, yeah, and or you'd, you'd roll, roll yeah. how many silver, how many copper, how many gold. Uh, uh, does it have a, tr- uh, a roll for this chart the, for potions, for scrolls? Right. Man, oh, I yeah. forgot about that. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things I really wish 5th edition would have kept. something Because like, half the time you're like, well, uh, what, ki- what kind of treasure is a, a shambling mound going to have? Uh Mm-hmm. You know, well, and then you got to make something up, and and you want it to be CR appropriate too, because you know, you know, if you just fought, a, yeah, a yeah, and that's just a CR twenty monster characters along more yeah. than it is just to find stuff. Yeah. yeah. What about you, uh, Bowl Gold buddy? Oh, I, in terms of magic items, I, it, Loke can attest to this. I don't really even hold on to them myself. I tend to let my class do what it is. I might have one or two by the end of the campaign. I'm not my dad bogarting every magic item that we come across. <laughs> Damn you, niggawart. Um, but in my campaigns, I actually like to give out um, mundane items with special effects, like yeah. uh, plate armor that's padded, so it's it, redu- it removes the stealth disadvantage. You know, and that's the kind of stuff that the that the artisans can make. Yeah, that's that makes it special over the magic items that are much more rare much harder to find because, well, if everybody has a magic item, yeah. nobody has a magic item. Uh, yeah, the I, I've taken to cheating yeah. and using like websites like Don John's and their random treasure generators <laughs> <laughs> where you, you put in the CR of the combat, the number of things, yep. and it ge- it generates your treasure what is a fitting. Tre- and you look at it and you say, oh, well, they're getting a luck blade. I don't use luck blades in my game. Yeah, cross that it's one just out. Not, yeah, yeah, it's not really fitting, or yeah. So, so, but it at least gives you, you know, you're looking at it. It's like, okay, well, you just fought a dra- a dragon horde's going to have thirty thousand gold, ten thousand platinum, and it at least gives you some kind of an idea of what's appropriate for that level of combat, which, like I said, I think is something that's just missing in the in the monster manual these days. Mm-hmm. And I think you you said something that really strikes true to what we started with. It's that seed, that promise. Why would those trolls have that uh, that treasure? What did they care about treasure? They just want to eat. All right. So the and they came out of the Edmores. That's a long walk. Okay. So they drug their treasure this whole way just so they can come down and find food. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, that's that promise of you know what to expect and how it should evolve in a in a campaign in a setting and what you should find. 
I, I, I'm, I'm just feeling because that was the thing, and I, that always bugged me. Like, because D and D is is really based a lot off of the Tolkien perspective. Like, it's really based off J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, The World, The Rangers, oh, Aragorn, yeah, and stuff part like of that. Appendix N. Yep, mm-hmm. and that. So that one questions me when you were saying that. I was just like, man, something's just, it, it's just odd when a troll, why would trolls have a bunch of swords? They, first off, they couldn't use them. They would have been less than even pocket knives for them. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you figured what sting was uh, was a sword to a hobbit, which is the halfling. Yeah, they, he called it a letter opener. Oh, le- yeah. yeah, a letter opener. Well, and then there's, you know, did you fight this troll in the forest or did you fight it in its lair? Yeah. This lair may have a bone pit where it throws all its dead bodies. Right. If you dig through that bo- bone sure. pit, you might yep. find better treasure that you're not going to find it right. on the pouch on the troll. <laughs> Fair <laughs> no. enough. I, I, awarding, awarding treasure, I think, is one of the weirdest things. And then Bog touched on it with, you know, Niggleort. I'm going to start doing that. Every time we have mention him, I'm going to do it like a Newman from Seinfeld. <laughs> Niggleort. Um, where he, sometimes he does hoard a little bit of the treasures and stuff like that. So you know, players are always going to argue over treasure. It always happens. There's always going to be a rogue that takes things. I had a rogue that just took gold. He didn't care about the treasure. He just wanted gold. He wanted money because he was like, I'm going to go retire on a private island. That's all I want to do in life. And I'm going to steal enough money that I can buy all the gold and I can live the life. But how, like, do you guys ever feel like you try to give out? And I know Loke's answer to this, but I want him to explain it as well. um, How you try to balance out treasure for the players. Uh, Like I said, a lot of times I'm using the app. If you're finding all the treasure there is, there's stuff that, is completely random generated, uh, you know. Yeah, but you you have a, pr- a, a chain of pure prayer breeds or something. Uh, the other thing I'll do is if there's something you're gonna, I know you're gonna be fighting werewolves. <laughs> I was I was gonna say I was gonna mention that. Yeah, I, I will load the treasure up with silvered weapons with weapons that do extra damage against werewolves. It's up to you to grab those. And then you will have them in the future. Come if you leave them behind, you don't search, you don't get those. That's things. not what happened. Tell them what <laughs> happened. <laughs> but uh, yeah, tell no, them what that, happened. Uh-oh. Or or if your your paladin decides to use a downtime activity to try and gain extra experience and walks off into the sunset and dies. <laughs> oh. oh no, it was actually the samurai. The samurai. Yeah, the samurai. It, it was the samurai. samurai. Right. Uh, my truck engine blew up and all my stuff was left in the truck and I didn't have his character sheet anymore. And oh. I, they, it was going to be months before I got back down to go get anything out of that truck. Actually, I just sold that truck. But yeah, yeah. no, the samurai had the and sword to fight the werewolves that yeah, we needed. The, the, basically, it was a, a katana of, la- of werewolf slaying. Had a special name. It was like a named sword. Ow, it was that, a, that's yeah. bad. You know, it was a special bad. craft. It was a, it was a very special sword, and the samurai got it. Obviously, it was a katana. It was made for the samurai. You see that the naming uh, rights of all my characters have gone away. <laughs> that's yeah. why I'm the pirate captain. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, but yeah, and then he he went off into the sunset and never came back with that special sword. Uh, and it's great that you do that too, because sometimes you got to break out of your own mind and your own shell of what you think. And having those random uh, places to find stuff, you know, to get those random uh, collections of treasure. Uh, I use also, I use those, and I also, Nord has uh, cards, treasure trove, and uh, uh, what's the objects of intrigue. Yeah. So there are different things that will help spur on those unusual pieces. And then, of course, I'll throw in things that I think that would be useful to players down the road. Or to help them make them feel more uh, capable of contributing to either combat or some certain situation. How do you guys feel about buffing spells with items? Like sometimes, like spell damage, like we talked about it last time, uh, cantrips. Sometimes cantrips just fall off, but it's the only spell that you can cast over and over without recourse. Like, how do you feel about items that buff spell damage? I, I, I you almost will never see like a item of spell storing. Well, I get that. Yeah, Um, that's one of those things. I I, because you're basically giving somebody a free level Mm -hmm. by giving them that item, and and so that kind of a buff you won't see now. If you uh, an amplifier of something, you know, something that's gonna like let's give you charisma modifier onto firebolt the way the warlock does for uh, Eldritch Blast. That might be something that. 
I'm just yeah, something it's like feasible. I, I've never done it, but like it's, a ring, it's something let's, that you might. We'll call it the ring of of uh, fire damage, and whenever you do fire damage, it adds like a uh, you double your proficiency well, monitor. Some to of you. the some of the cantrips do, uh, but the can- increase yeah, but at they, your level, like at yeah. fifth level, yeah, but they don't add an extra die. They don't right. the the damage that they do becomes so minuscule once you get to later levels. And then you got these long running. You don't have time to short rest in well, every dungeon. Well, that's well, part of the the um, the economy of of the class is mm-hmm. yeah. yes. Uh, learning when to uh, use your spells correctly and and uh, where they're going to be most effective. I have burn them. I have the most fantastic scenario that just recently happened. Okay, there was a combat. the The front line people went in to fight. The people behind were not actually fully contributing. They were, first off, it was just a set of circumstances because, you know, uh, setup and terrain always plays a part in whatever I do. Uh, And it kind of played very badly for part of it. Uh, And so they had that. And then the spells that they chose were too low level or were not, they just weren't fully capable of running their character at this higher level. And this was a full-on battle. This is their hardest battle they've ever done. And afterwards, of course, after they barely survived, they actually got their asses handed to them, ran away. Half of them ran away. The other half were dead on the ground, except for one who was playing chicken, healed them up so that they can get the people that were down out of that room and hide in another area while everybody could rest up to try to meet back up again. So... There is, like you said, there's absolutely in combat an action economy that if you are not doing your top provided spells or uh, support, especially what you were talking about with the support characters, people don't think of running support characters like support characters. They think they should be up in the fray, getting pounded or pounding and doing things like that when no, they should be a bard is like the best example of that by throwing out the inspiration by doing this, by throwing a healing, by they they have so many opportunities in just one round, but if they're not doing it right, they're missing those moments, and then it starts to snowball. And again, like Action Economy, you only have so many actions within so many rounds. Either you're alive or dead after three rounds or four rounds because there's going to be so much damage coming out from the bad guys that people are going to start drop, 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 and then it's over. Yeah, I I feel that because in the short rest and the warlock, I think the warlock is the, the perfect. Yeah, we get things back on a short rest, mm-hmm. but you're sitting there holding. And we talked about this with the hexblade warlock. I love the hexblade warlock. I think it's a great idea. You want to talk about something that is better than the blade singer when it comes to being a melee fighter style uh, mage of any sort. It is the hexblade, but they have one ability that makes that that defines that whole class. And if you use it, you're pretty much done until you get to 15th level, which is like, all right, half. sometimes your campaigns don't make it that far. Or by that time, that character may have died, and that's the idea I'm getting behind it, is that, you know, sometimes I think that cantrip damage just doesn't scale as much as it should. I think it needs so, to scale a little bit more. What, what I would say, what you're talking about, that first off, have you ever tried to play a Warlock without using Eldritch Blast? Yes. And everybody hates you for it. Yes. And but I and did not, badass at it. Right. And it, I, I was having great fun with it. But it just people couldn't understand it. That's and, that's the beauty of like the Hexblade because you mix it with uh, mm-hmm. Pact of the Weapon. And you, you're you changing weapons on a bonus action. Guess what? When you change your weapons, you become proficient with it. I was dual wielding, going to sword and shield, like whatever combat needed. I was like, oh, crap. I'm about to get my face blade mm-hmm. in. Bonus action. Shield up. Sword out. Let's go. And I, I think that's... You're right. People hate yeah. you for not doing the one thing you need, but at the same time, I feel. But if you're having to use a cantrip to win a battle, then there might be already a problem. It's but if you're in like a dungeon and you're going back to back to back to back to back, because there's really no you're, short rest. Who in does dungeons. that? I don't if know you're, what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> I feel it's not all the short rest. <laughs> See, and that that comes back to the group working as a team. If the group knows the warlock needs a short rest. You know, you only mm-hmm. get two spells up to three at a higher but level. But you got to remember, Warlock also, each spell level is their spell level. Yeah. So it's not like a wizard casting at eighth, he's an eighth level mage casting at first level. That's a first level spell. A Warlock at eighth level casting a spell is at eighth level. Right. Yeah. But 
but you know, you know, if your warlock's used his spells, you need to take that short rest and get him his spells mm-hmm. back. Uh, you know, the party wants to rush on and knock down the door. Yeah, you that, hear that bog? You got to hold yeah. off for the warlock. Yeah, I didn't make especially to me. like <laughs> like the the new genie warlock. Are you jump in your bottle for ten minutes and oh. you're good to what? go? You've not oh, seen yeah, the genie yeah. warlock? No. Oh man, it's yeah, pretty good. Where's this from? Tasha's. Tasha's. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tasha's yeah. is good. I like Tasha's. Yeah, and that 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 yeah. that bottle could actually be a ring that you give to your barbarian. Mm-hmm. I've you had could... to live in artificer yeah. the whole time <laughs> yeah. because of somebody else. <laughs> oh. And, and that genie warlock can, once he gets to a certain level, can bring pretty much the whole party into. Yeah, and then he gets to ca- yeah, and somebody and else can ha- carry it around. Yeah, somebody else carry it around for ten minutes, and and everybody in, inside rest? gets a short rest. Yeah, wow. Yeah, you got to go take a look at it. Yeah, so so you get the one guy that's healthy mm-hmm. to pick up your bottle, go hide somewhere with it, take a short rest, and you're all back in. That's that's now, that new, would be that would be evil and funny. You kick everybody that's in the bottle out of the room. You drop the yeah. bottle off in and the middle then, of the ocean, and then the person that's carrying the it has can to survive out of the bottle. Okay, that's fine. Well, they can if they're sleeping. Yeah. Yeah, but who needs to sleep when you have that elder G vocation? Ah, mm-hmm. uh, see, or if you're also a uh, uh, elf, all I got to do is go into a trance. Yeah, in short rest, you don't have to sleep on a short rest. No. You just don't no. have to do any yeah. activity. All righty. Well, that being said, we're pretty much done here for this episode. I want to thank James S. Austin. You can go to jamessaustin.com. That is also. Uh, his personal work information, Tacitus Publishing, and that's T-A-C-I-T-U-S, publishing.com, drive through RPG. He's got a Facebook page, Red Wyvern Inn. You're going to be able to find that on our Facebook page. That's Chef Bolg and Pirate Captains, recipes for everything. Email us, uh, Chef Bolg and PC at gmail.com with all your questions, your answers, your comments, gripes, bitches, complaints, that old adage. It's been fun. Without with that being said, say goodbye, Bog. Goodbye, Bog. Bye, Loke. Bye, everybody. This goodbye. has been a good episode.